G'day Internet, welcome back to another video. Now, since the dawn of the PC era, anyone who was into computers would generally go out and build their own computer or pay a local shop to build the computer to their spec. But one thing I have noticed is there seems to be quite a bit of a nostalgia for brand name computers, which is kind of interesting given the reason I said before. Now, it's usually machines like Compaq and HP's and more so in America, things like Gateway 2000s. But one brand that you don't seem to see that much of and who is still a massive player in the PC world is Dell. So I went out and I bought this, Ugh. which is a bit of a tank. This here is a Dell Optiplex GXA. And the reason I went out and got this is I wanted to see if a boring business machine can be turned into something a little bit more interesting. Now, I think one of the reasons that Dell isn't as popular on YouTube and stuff like that is that, at least in Australia, Dell never really had much of a retail presence. So mum and dad couldn't go down to Harvey Norman or whatever and buy a Dell. It was always a HP or a Compaq or an IBM or an Acer. Dell has always been firmly cemented into the business world and they still are today. And for a simple reason, if you're a medium to large business uh, and a computer breaks, all you want to do is to be able to pick up the phone and go, g'day Dell, the computer broke, come fix it. And the next day, a 19 year old technician rocks up with a box of parts and a screwdriver and fixes your computer and you're underway again. And from a business point of view, that's all you want to care about is just simply to keep your computer fleet going. So this Optiplex here is probably the most generic business machine from the late 90s. Uh, this model was released, I believe, in 1997, and it is probably the most boring beige box you can think of from that era. Now, I've got a bit of an idea of what the spec is of this machine, but I do know it's quite dusty inside. So how about we pull it to pieces, give it a clean, and also see what's running inside this box. Now, one thing I've always appreciated about Dill machines is how easy they are to get into. You've simply got two buttons, one on each side, push them in, lift up the cover, and you're in. So fairly straightforward, floppy disk and CD-ROM over here, hard drive tucked down here, motherboard processor, we've got a riser card and a power supply. So the easiest thing to get out initially is the riser card, which is simply one lever and the whole thing comes out. Next we'll take the drives out and this is pretty simple, simply disconnect the cables from the CD-ROM and floppy drive. power supply on the CD-ROMs, a bit finicky. You've got two latches and the floppy drive comes out. Same two latches and the optical drive comes out. Nice. The hard drive is actually one of the few components that has a screw just tucked down here, but we should be able to just simply unplug the IDE cable, unplug the Molex power, and one screw. And out comes the hard drive. Power supply is just as easy, one screw. Power supply slides back and out it comes. It's kind of dusty. Motherboard seems to be equally as easy with one screw back here. And I believe this should just slide backwards. Yep, and out it comes. And with a grand total of three screws, we have the entire machine pretty much disassembled. So if we take a quick look at the back of the motherboard, there's no huge surprises here. We've got serial parallel, couple of PS2 ports, 
a couple of what are either USB 1.0 or 1.1 ports, I'm not actually 100% sure. Uh, another serial port, VGA out, uh, 100 megabit ethernet uh, and ports for a sound card. Taking a look at the motherboard itself, obviously we have three RAM slots at the top. Uh, this is where our slot one processor goes. These two chips here make up the Intel 440LX chipset. Uh, the chip down here with the fancy writing on it is actually our 3Com network uh, controller. Uh, we've got an ATI 3D Rage Pro uh, chip here, which actually sits on the AGP bus. Uh, and down here we have a crystal sound chip. Also nestled inside our box of boring, we have a Pentium 2 266, uh, a four gig Mac store hard drive, uh, and 64 meg of RAM. Right, so I've bolted the machine back together at least as enough as it needs to be. Uh, let's give it some power. And drop into the BIOS, which is Control Alt Enter, which is a little odd. Now, one thing I do like about the Dell BIOSes of this year is it actually gives you some useful information and not just settings. So you can see here, we've got a four gig hard drive. Um, it hasn't detected the processor properly, which is concerning. Got a CD-ROM drive. Uh, we've got 64 meg of RAM. We've got two meg on the ATI Pro. Uh, and that's kind of it. Oh, and our three and a half inch hard drive. Let's see if I can work out why it's not detecting the processor properly. Right, I had actually bumped off the jumper pin that sets the CPU speed. Well done. So obviously the machine boots up at least to the BIOS. I've got no idea what's on that hard drive though, so, or if it works. So, uh, escape to exit. And it is running Windows XP on a Pentium 2 266 with 64 meg of RAM. Um, yeah, okay. Not the operating system I would have put on this machine. And we're booted, I think. Hard drive's still doing something probably thrashing the page file. But it is up and working. I shouldn't have opened up my computer. Right, there we go. So let's get rid of that. So I probably don't need to tell you that uh, Windows XP is not, shall we say, the optimal operating system for this machine, given its limited specifications. So I think the first upgrade I'm gonna give this machine is this SD to IDE uh, adapter, replace the old Mac store hard drive, uh, and I'll drop Windows 98 onto the SD card. Right, so we've now got a fairly fresh install of Windows 98 on the machine. But before we throw any more upgrades at it, which I have planned, uh, how about we run a benchmark? Now, benchmarks really aren't my thing, uh, and I don't know that much about them, so I just kind of went for the default 3D Mark 99, which kind of seems period correct, but I ran into a problem. Uh, so this has an ATI Rage Pro with two meg of RAM. Now it is expandable up to four. Um, you might have seen the uh, dim socket uh, on the board, um, but I don't have a RAM chip to throw in there. And it seems 3D Mark 99 doesn't like this video card very much. Let me show you. So if I go in here and go new 3D benchmark, for starters, it'll tell me because of, I have less than four meg of video RAM, it won't do 800 by 600, which is fine. If I go in here, I can change it to 640 by 480, and I can run the benchmark. Now it seems to load okay. But the actual 3D images, as you can see, and I hope I'm not giving you epilepsy right about now, 
is just a mess. All the textures are gone, the whole lot. So I don't know if this is really running a legitimate benchmark or not, but I'll let it run and we'll get a score out of it. And there we go. We have a score of 1,121 3D marks and 2,546 CPU 3D marks. Whatever that actually means. And given I was going to install it later anyway, I dropped Unreal Tournament on the machine and I seem to sit around 9 to 11 frames a second. So we now have a stable computer with a more appropriate uh, operating system running on it. So now it's time to get to the fun bit of actually putting some upgrades into this machine. So first up is some memory. I've got 256 meg of RAM here. This is actually PC133, but it will certainly do the job. Next is sound. Now it's got a crystal sound chip on it, but I'd, A, I'd like to go a little bit better, and B, it has no gain port. So if I ever want to plug a joystick in, I suppose I could use USB, but, um, and I couldn't even find any headers. You know how a lot of time with onboard sound, there'll be like a header where you can put a 15-pin gain port on a bracket out the back? None of that. So... We have here a Oreo Vortex 1, which is going to go in there, which should be a nice little sound upgrade. And finally is the processor. Now, if you remember when we were looking back at the motherboard, this thing runs a 440LX uh, chipset on the motherboard, uh, which is the earlier version of the more popular 440BX based motherboards. Now, the downside of that is the LX is actually limited to a 66 megahertz front side bus. That was the big upgrade for the BX. So it, the BX, for instance, uh, supports a 100 megahertz front side bus, and that's why you're able to run everything up to early Pentium 3s on it. So given that 66 megahertz front side bus, the fastest processor I can put in this thing uh, is a Pentium 2 333, and it's the fastest one this machine actually supports. So we've got that to put in it as well. Right, upgrading the RAM is obviously very simple. Let's pop out this single 64 meg chip uh, and drop in these two 128 meg chips and pop out the processor. And this is where we actually run into a bit of a problem. Both these processors look like they have the same heatsink on it, but they're not. Uh, the one that's just come out of the machine, you might be able to see a screw hole here and here, and this one doesn't have it. Now, you may think I might just simply swap the heatsinks, but if you've ever tried to swap the heatsink on a Pentium 2 processor, you know that the simple rule is don't. At the end of the day, all you're going to end up with is broken plastic clips and probably a ruined processor. But I need to be able to mount this fan onto this processor. And without the screw holes, I'm going to have to resort to something, well, a little bit dodgy. Yes, that's right. We've gone with zip ties. Now, you might think that this heatsink is actually big enough uh, to keep the thing cool as it is, but honestly, even with the fan, the other heatsink was actually quite warm in when I removed the processor. Also, this Dell will not boot without a fan connected. It will just throw a fan error and turn off. So with a faster CPU and some more RAM and a half decent sound card now on the machine, we're starting to get to something a little bit more reasonable. But let's be honest, we're just kind of dancing around the peripheral at this stage. We're we're just at the entree. What we really want is the main course. So, what do we have next? And here it is, delivered upon the backs of angels. Yes, it is a 3DFX 12 megabyte Voodoo 2. Now, the 3DFX is obviously a legendary graphics card. And it is perfect for this particular situation where we've got rubbish integrated graphics and no spare AGP port. So it's the perfect upgrade. I should point out that I've never actually owned a 3DFX Voodoo before. Never. Uh, my first half decent graphics card uh, was a GeForce 2 MX. I kind of skipped the whole Voodoo uh, 3DFX scene. 
Uh, so this is going to be something new for me as well. Now, with the riser cut out, this really couldn't be easier. Uh, let's take out the screw. We'll also take out uh, the next one as well. Interestingly, these are actually the original Dell ones. I'm not sure if you can see that, but it's got the uh, Dell engraved uh, into the cover. The Mighty 3DFX obviously goes in here. And we can finally mount our uh, SD to IDE adapter while we're at it. Now, you will have noticed up until this point that I've had this machine plugged into a Samsung uh, LCD monitor. But if we're going to go to the effort of building this Dell Optiplex into a half decent machine, we have to do it properly. Yes, I managed to source a proper Dell 17 inch monitor for this machine and it weighs a ton and paired up with a nice set of period correct speakers, it makes quite the nice 90s machine. So I've run 3D Mark again, uh, and as you can see, we've had quite the uptick uh, on the actual 3D score to 26.95, which is up from, what was it, about 1100? Uh, about 11, 1200 before, so that's a 200% increase. And running around in Unreal Tournament, I seem to be getting a good solid, say, 30 frames a second, which is obviously a massive improvement over the 9 or 10 we were getting on the ATI Rage. Now that it's all in one piece and looking quite splendid in its 90s beigeness, uh, I'm going to do something a little unusual and actually take some time to play some games. Uh, I've installed a handful of classic 3DFX supporting games, uh, and we are going to start off with Unreal Tournament because it is a personal favourite of mine. Now, Unreal Tournament is one of those games that seems to scale just really well on any machine you try and run it on. And it's also one of those games that supports almost every... Oh, got him. Every video standard. I mean, it does Direct3D, I believe it does OpenGL, and obviously it does 3DFX Glide as well. So, just after shooting that last scene of Unreal Tournament, things went a little pear-shaped. So after I turned off the camera, I thought it dawned on me that did I see a bit of artifacting happening in Unreal Tournament? A few little glitches, perhaps? And I did. If you look carefully, you'll see a few glitches as I run down this hallway. And in case you missed it, here's a slow motion version of that. I also decided to spark up GL Quake, which is obviously the uh, glide version of Quake 1. Uh, and after about 10 minutes of gameplay, the whole thing just corrupted. The game was still running, but you couldn't really see anything. You could hit tilde and you could kind of make out the console coming down, but that was about it. Now, I spent a few minutes kind of poking around at drivers and stuff, but that obviously was not going to go anywhere. Driver issues generally manifest themselves in it just not working at all, not a gradual decline in something going wrong. It was clearly heat related. Now, this is a fairly cramped computer, um, and from what I can gather talking to people, uh, Voodoo 2s do run, shall we say, a little warm. At this point, I basically had two options. I could either not stress out a 25-year-old computer uh, on a 30-plus degree day in a tin shed in the middle of the Australian summer, or, or I could spend three days uh, coming up with a convoluted and probably unnecessary cooling system for the computer. 
So where we left off in the expansion bay, we've got the IDE to SD adapter, we've got the Voodoo 2, and we've got the Oil Vortex, all in reasonably close quarters to each other, like I said, in a small case. And this computer doesn't really have much in the way of cooling. So here is the expansion unit out of the Dell. Uh, obviously this is where our ISA and PCI slots are. When it comes to cooling a computer like this, short of doing something really ludicrous like liquid cooling, you've basically got only a couple of things you can play with. So the first thing I decided to do was to add heat sinks to the Voodoo. And as you can see here, the Voodoo got a healthy dose of bling. Now, admittedly, it was really only the main processor chips uh, that were generating most of the heat, but I figured while I was in there, I may as well add heat sinks to all the RAM chips, including the reverse side as well. So this can now go back into the computer. But at the end of the day, heat sinks can only do so much. Uh, you still really need something to carry that heat away. Uh, and the most obvious choice is a fan. But the thing is in this computer, where do I put one? I could easily take a fan and put it at the front here, and that would obviously blow air directly over uh, the GPU to a degree. Uh, the problem with that is there's, not there's a bit of a grill here and a little bit here, but there's nothing on the actual cover of the computer. Now, I did actually put one here and it would kind of pull air up from the gap between the front cover and the computer, um, but it was, let's say, less than inefficient. The most logical place would be to utilize the grills at the side here and put one in here. Either way, the old hard drive is gonna have to go. But the problem with this, obviously, is that it's blowing the air the wrong way. It's blowing it well, at the CD-ROM drive, and that's really not something that we want to cool. We want to cool this thing here. So I then busted out my 3D printer and made a duct, which goes here. Obviously, these will fold out of the way and it sits on top. And either way, the original hard drive is going to have to come out now. Uh, but it does quite efficiently pull air in from the outside at the side of the case and blow it across the GPU. So I can now put this in. This, of course, then raised the next problem. Yes, I'm blowing air from the fan across the Voodoo, but that air then has nowhere to go. There are some vents kind of off to the side here, but in reality, that's not exactly the best use of airflow. So the only thing really to do was to remove the uh, SD card adapter and put a grill in the back to allow the air to flow from here straight through to the back of the machine, like that. Now that's pretty much the cooling sorted. Uh, I stress tested this uh, running GL Quake on Time Lemo Dupe for about 45 minutes and it ran fine, even in 30 plus degree heat. But the problem then is, is what do we do with this? Now I guess I could just kind of wedge it down in here and be done with it, but that's kind of, well, ugly, and seeing as I'd already gone this far in a convoluted plan, why not keep going? And at the end of the day, one of the main benefits of an SD card like this is the ability to easily remove the card and drop software onto the computer it's plugged into. It was while pondering this issue, I noticed on the right hand side is this removable cover. And I thought to myself, I wonder if that actually leads anywhere. And what do you know, it does. There is this little cutout in the case that leads in underneath the CD-ROM drive. Now, honestly, I've got no idea what this was used for. If anybody does know, please leave a comment down below. I'm guessing maybe like a PCMSA adapter or something like that. Um, but it does line up perfectly with that cover on the outside case. So I then took the original design from this bracket, added some wings on it, and managed to adapt it to the two screw holes uh, that were already in the case. And this mounts it perfectly out through the side. And just like that. And this brackety thing that holds the uh, CD-ROM and floppy even has a cutout 
at the bottom to slide through the IDE cable and the power cable. So that really only left one last issue and that's this side cover. Now, I could have just simply cut a hole in this, but honestly, it's not something I'm actually particularly good at. So if you wanted to see a complete mess, yes, that's what I could have done. So, more 3D printing, I designed a replacement uh, and gave it a semi kind of matching coat of paint. It was white, uh, which really stood out. So this is slightly less bad. So this really only left me one last problem to solve, but can you guess what it is? But that's okay because I then redesigned the uh, rear vent bracket to mount a potentiometer into it. So with all those shenanigans out of the way, the voodoo behaving himself in this heat, uh, how about we actually get back to what I wanted to do, and that's play some games on this uh, quite beast of an Optiplex. And I'm going to start off now, this time, uh, with GL Quake, because, I mean, I played Quake back in the day under with software renderer, and obviously I've played the modern ports that allow use with um, like NVIDIA cards and modern graphics cards and stuff like that. But I've never, because I've never owned a Voodoo card before, um, I've never actually been able to run GL Quake. So Quake 1 is one of those games that, if you're my age, you can pretty much play by muscle memory at this point. But when I played it back in the day, it was just on the basic software renderer, and that was pretty much about it. Like I said, I didn't have a Voodoo, so I was never able to enjoy it looking like this. And honestly, I didn't experience graphics like this until, I don't know, I was had my 2MX or whatever. Even the Reva TNT didn't do anything like this. And let's not forget that Quake 2 came natively with uh, 3DFX support. So if you were lucky enough back in the day, you got to enjoy Quake 2 looking like this. And it's not all about first-person shooters. Here is Need for Speed uh, SE, which you could add 3D effects support to. And it looks just awesome. And it's little things like the raindrops on your screen uh, and things like that, or the extra effects when you hit the wall, which I do on a regular basis. But one thing it really does have is an awesome soundtrack. So even if you ignore the huge sidetrack that I made with the cooling on this machine, which, look, at the end of the day, don't do what I did. Um, just don't run an old computer in the stinking hot Aussie summer. It's as simple as that. But I think we've actually turned this Dell into quite a nice late 90s gaming machine um, between the upgraded sound card, more RAM, faster processor, um, well, faster hard drive, I guess, although it's still limited by the ATA33 or whatever it is, ATA66 IDE bus that's in this machine. But most of all, that Voodoo 2 card, which I'm just amazed, given that that card is 22, 25 years old, 24 maybe, something like that. Um, it's got to be celebrating its 25th birthday soon. And as a complete package um, with its period correct speakers and its matching monitor, keyboard and mouse, had I come across this machine in 97, 98, whatever it was, uh, my 19, 20 year old brain would have just gone Poof! and to hear the sound and see the graphics that this case can do and the games that supported it really took advantage of that card, 
It's just awesome and I absolutely love this machine. Now, as I mentioned, this is the first Voodoo I have ever owned and I'm absolutely positive that I have barely scratched the surface of the good games that ran on the Glide API and this graphics card. So please let me know the games that I should check out down in the comments because I really want to make time uh, to play more on this machine. But for now, that will pretty much do it. If you like the video, click like, subscribe, all the usual youtube -y stuff. If you'd like to help support the channel, we are on Patreon, just like these wonderful people just here. But until then, I will see you in the next one.